All right, I believe we're live here from Central Florida. My name is Brother Mike Homer. I'm with Right Division Ministries. I'm the author of the King James Only Debate at kjvdebate.com. One of the unique features of my book, I believe, is that it does offer all the uh, source documentation um, under the EndNotes tab at kjvdebate.com. So you can get the book at the, my website or you can get it on Amazon like to do a real short review of the Dr. James White versus Dr. Thomas Ross debate over the LSB Bible versus the King James Bible. In my previous video on YouTube, I already provided sufficient and internal evidence for the fellowship reading in Ephesians 3, 9 in the King James Bible. And Nick Sayers um, wrote an entire book on Revelation 16, 5 on the reading of the King James Bible of Anne Shelt B. So I'm not going to discuss those two points that Dr. White brought up very much here, but I am going to focus on a couple other arguments that he used that, in my opinion, has pretty much run out of steam. Before we do that, I do want us to get a feel of the contextual uh, consideration of the fellowship reading in Ephesians 3.9, for context is king, and we must go by what the scripture itself says within the context. We are in a fellowship with Jesus Christ, as 1 Corinthians 1, 9 reveals. The disciples gave Paul and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship from Galatians 2, 9. They didn't give them the right hand of a plan or an administration or a dispensation. It doesn't even make uh, sense. We are in the fellowship of the ministering to the saints from 2 Corinthians 8, 4. We have a fellowship in the gospel from Philippians 1, 5. We have a fellowship in the spirit from Philippians 2.1. We have a fellowship in Christ's sufferings from Philippians 3.10. We have fellowship with the Heavenly Father and fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, which is in 1 John 1.3. We have a fellowship one with another, 1 John 1.7. And we can clearly see that the fellowship of the, of the mystery is in uniting both Jew and Gentile, as the context in Ephesians 3, 6 already tells us, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, same body of Christ. This is a fellowship. Paul also says in Ephesians 5, 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So the fellowship reading flows, it's natural, and it's in the context of scripture. Now, Isaiah 28, 9 through 13, as I mentioned in my previous video, it talks all about the context being the king, precept upon precept, line upon line. And I'm, fi I'm finding out that a lot of these videos, textual debate videos, are ignoring more and more the entire context of Scripture, the internal evidence, which I think should be priority number one. Even in John's revelation of, of Revelation 16, 5, where he says, and shall be, it is consistent in the context of scripture of Revelation 1, 4, where he says, in which is to come. In Revelation 1, 8, it says, in which is to come. Revelation 4, 8, and is to come. Revelation 11, 17, and art to come, along with Revelation 16, 5, and shall be. So it flows contextually. I believe that a lot of modern textual criticism, they're creating these little crisis things like Ephesians 3, 9 and Revelation 16, 5, and they're using arguments that just really don't carry a lot of weight, such as Erasmus being a Roman Catholic and only had a few manuscripts. And I think these are look over here moments to focus on some of the smaller issues like straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel, or ignoring some of the more important uh, aspects of this entire debate. Uh, a false flag operation is when a crisis is created by one party in order for that same par party to offer a solution to the crisis that they themselves created. And I think we see a lot of this in modern criticism, like the Erasmus being a Roman Catholic and only had a few ma manuscripts. It really that, that argument has really run out of steam. Almost everyone prior to Luther was Roman Catholic, including Luther himself. Erasmus laid the egg that Luther hatched. Many in Rome had issues with him. He was on the fence, in my opinion, for his New Testament editions was his top priority. If he'd have paired up 100% with Luther, he never would have finished those New Testament Greek editions. 
And it was over 500 years ago. So more than likely, he had a lot more manuscript evidence than we know about. The KJV translators used a lot more than just Erasmus's Greek New Testament editions also. They used Beza, they used Stephanus, they used uh, the Syriac, the Old Italic, the Old Latin, the Hebrew. They used a lot more than thou shalt use the Greek alone, which, you know, there's nowhere that says thou shalt use the Greek alone. In my opinion, Dr. White underestimates and somewhat insults the intelligence of not only the reformers, but of the King James translators, 47 of the best scholars the world has ever known. Perhaps I can recommend to Dr. White that he takes a refresher course on Frederick Nolan's extensive dissertation on the received text going back to the first century. Now, the Book of Acts and some good geographical Bible maps will also help. And are we to believe that 500 years ago they actually had less than what we have today? I don't, I don't think so. Where do scholars think that the Byzantine and the received text came from? It's as the way they talk in these debates is it, it, it seems as if it just fell off of a magical carpet ride in the 12th century. Like there's no history, there's no chain of custody for this. The, the Byzantine text has a provenance, a history, a chain of custody. The Texas Receptus, which is Latin for the received text, which I believe is a guide, a God guided revision of the majority text, and it has a history and a chain of custody. The King James Bible is a result of this providential guidance by God, God's preservation, his promises of preservation. And Dr. Ross does bring up preservation quite a bit in this debate, which I think was one of his strong points. Now, dissertations on the history of the received text and the Byzantine text are very lacking today. Uh, Kurt and Barbara Olland said, quote, no adequate history of the Byzantine text has yet been done. And you can find out more about this in uh, Jonathan Sheffield's uh, uh, James White Halloween special. I recommend that video on YouTube for anybody. Neither is there an adequate history of the received text, in my opinion, showing a, a link in the first several centuries of the church. And I don't believe there's been a lot of history uh, or dissertations done on the pre waldensian and Old Italic, which ended up in Reformation areas. It's all crickets. Dr. White uses the King James Bible archaic fallacy, in my opinion. You honestly think a few English words to look up is harder than learning the Greek and the Hebrew? Bible teachers are supposed to teach, are they not? So teach. The King James Bible has less than 0.2% of archaic words out of over 775,000 words in the Bible. It's not an issue. It's a very, very small percentage of words that we're supposed to teach. The word count is, like I said, is 0.2%. Now, definitions of most words are within the context of the verse itself. You look over here, one of the words Dr. White used is pate, which is in Psalm 716. It's only used one time. It's such a big problem, isn't it? Pate. Psalm 716, his mischief shall fall upon his own head and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own pate. It's talking about the top of your head there. Here's another one. John 20, 16, Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say master. And it tells you the definition of that particular word. You look at Almug and Algum trees. If you look at the context, you know it's talking about trees that's used five times. Chode is only used twice in the King James Bible, and that's to strive or to argue. This one here is actually a valley. It's only used one time, but it's talking about a valley of craftsmen right there. Chap is dry ground, only used one time, you know, like chap lips. Earing is plowing, used twice. Got up early in the morning, used 20 times. Same as got up early in the morning or got up early. I mean, it's not really a big deal. Hosen, one time, that's trousers. Leasing is lies. We talked about pate. I mean, it's really, it's, the percentage is so small. It's not an issue when you look at the entire Bible. It's a look over here moment. So to, in these examples right here, just out of those, the total word count in Dr. White's list is 85. Divided by the entirety of the Bible, you have 0.010968%. So it's really not an issue. This is a strain it in that and a look over here, false flag. Look over here. In other words, we don't want you to see what's over here, but look over here at this 0.01% problem. But let's look at the camels below. 
Meanwhile, the LSB admits the blood of Christ in Colossians 1.14. The LSB changes God to a he in 1 Corinthians 3.16. Now, Dr. White used to believe with, uh, in the God reading in his book. I don't know if he's consistent today in the year 2023, if he still believes that that is backed up by the manuscript ab evidence in 1 Timothy 3.16. The LSB changes only begotten son to the Gnostic heresy of only begotten God in John 1, 18. The LSB admits the second coming of Christ in Isaiah 66, 5. And these are just a few small examples out of hundreds and hundreds of changes in the modern Bibles. So, you know, look over here, but don't look over here. So it's a, it's a distractionary tactic, in my opinion. Now, the Bible's meant to mold God's people into having the mind of Christ by elevating them and raising the bar in a translation. It is not meant to dumb them down to a street level translation that does not reflect the true language of God. It is a good thing to have a few challenging words that stimulate the church into further inquiry. And the King James Bible has a fifth grade reading level. It's very easy to understand. It flows and it's much more easier to memorize. This comes from Adam Nicholson, which we have a news break here. God speaks English also. Scholars are shocked to find out that God also speaks the English language. Okay, that's live. Newsflash. This comes from Nicholson. He says, the King James Bible speaks to us in God's language, which is not ordinary. How can one even attempt to change this majestic language? Modern translations aim not to embody the music of the holy. None of them are interested in creating an atmosphere or conveying even a sense of mystery, the strangeness and uniqueness that the scriptures address. They instead famously as the director of the New English Bible said in the 60s, wanted to create a timeless prose in which archa archaism and hallowed associations were to be avoided and a sense of reality sought. Saw, saw <clears throat> this sense of reality is actually a sense of total ordinariness. It is an idea of human reasoning that information was what was required, just information. Just adjust the ordinary facts as transmitted by the most boring and uninspired people who ever lived. I think that was well said by Adam Nicholson on the, uh, the, the uh, King James Bible. In conclusion, in my opinion, Dr. Ross provided the necessary scriptures with, with, along with data regarding God's promises of preservation of his word. He exposed the inconsistencies of the critical text, and he offered data in slides that the viewer can review to research the issues for themselves. In my opinion, Dr. White focused on the scholars' go-to verses of Revelation 16.5 and Ephesians 3.9, the look over here, false flag operation, and created another look over here moment using the archaic words fallacy, and made some silly claims which in my opinion insults the intelligence of both Erasmus and the King James translators. He ignored the history of the received text, claiming it just suddenly sprung up late somehow, and he avoided any mention of the context of scripture. Now, Dr. Ross really didn't get into the context of scripture either, which I think these issues need to be addressed when you're talking about anything, any wording in the Bible, you have to look at the context first. So in conclusion, as I said in my prior video, God wants us to be certain that we have his perfect word. He wants us to be 100% 100% sure that it's pure and perfect, it's preserved, and it's error-free. And that's what God wants. Proverbs 22 and 21 that I might might that God says I want you to know the certainty of the words of truth that thou mightest mightest answer the words of truth to them that send on today. And another thing, we walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And usually in these debates, when you bring up God's providence or the faith issue, then as some scholars say, the debate is over. So, but what about the faith that you have, the faith in the science, the, the, the faith in modern textual criticism or the belief in a reconstruction method? Is, that, is, is not that faith also? So it takes faith either way, no, no matter how you look at it. But I want all Bible believers to know that you can be 100% sure 
that you have the perfect words of God in the King James Bible. And that's what we believe. And we believe it by faith. It has a co continuity and a consistency about it. It flows. It has an unction. And I talked a little bit about that in my previous video. So thank you. It's quick. It's short. Hopefully it's sweet. Been to the point. I want to thank you for listening to the review between Dr. White and Ross. Your uh, support of my book at KJV Debate would be greatly appreciated. And I hope to hear from you again from sunny central Florida. Shoot me an email at writethevisionministry at gmail.com. And uh, you're always invited down here. God bless you. And have a wonderful day.